Flying Scotsman, the best known of Britain's crack express trains, no longer stops at Darlington. But it was between Darlington and Stockton, famous names in railway history, that a locomotive pulled a passenger train for the first time in the world. In 1825, amid a cloud of smoke and steam, it trundled through Darlington into an excited English countryside. Behind it, a man with an equally famous name, George Stevenson. And this was his locomotive, Locomotion No. 1, that pulled the train that started a new era of travel. Only a few miles from Darlington to Stockton, but a journey that was to alter man's whole tempo of living. There was some opposition, but over the next 20 years, railway travel caught the public fancy. New lines pushed out into rural England, bringing the towns ever closer together. Stevenson's famous rocket at the Rainhill Trials in 1829 proved conclusively that the steam locomotive had come to stay. Parallel with the progress of railway expansion is the history of engine power and speed. The Hardwick in 1895, in a race from London to Aberdeen, covered 140 miles at an average speed of 67 miles an hour. In 1904, the city of Truro travelled at 102 miles an hour. Today, maintained with loving care, she runs excursions for railway enthusiasts. Power increased. In 1938, the Mallard wrote perhaps the final chapter in steam locomotive annals. A 126 miles an hour still stands, a world speed record for steam. From very early on, British steam locomotive pioneers sent many countries their first iron horses, helping to link far distant peoples and to develop the arteries of trade. The tradition is carried on today in the export of British diesel, electric and steam locomotives to all parts of the world. Electric traction was the first to follow steam. Its value has long been proved on routes with heavy traffic in and around great cities such as London. Seventy years experience in electrifying railways already lie behind the services running today in Britain. The Industrial North was the first to have a trunk route handling all traffic electrically. 
Taking their power from an overhead DC system, these powerful electric locomotives operate between Manchester, Sheffield and Watt. Their route lies across the 2,000-foot-high Pennine Hills, difficult terrain, especially in bad weather. Electric locomotives enable a large quantity of heavy coal traffic to be hauled easily and speedily over this arduous route. the British Transport Commission announced a 15-year plan for the modernization of British railways. Vast and imaginative in scope, it heralded a new era of travel for Britain and presented an exciting challenge to British railways and the locomotive manufacturers. A feature of the plan is electrification of certain main and suburban lines using high-voltage AC power. For example, trunk routes between Liverpool, Manchester and London and the Northeast and London will take power from the countrywide national grid system, passing it to the locomotives through an overhead contact wire supported by the lightweight structures which the high voltage system permits. Another feature is the introduction of diesel traction on the remaining routes. Of the 2,500 diesel locomotives called for, many are already in service. Different types for different purposes. The 2,000 horsepower diesel electric for express journeys from London to the north. The 800 horsepower diesel electric for heavy freight. The 1,200 horsepower diesel here operated in multiple with one driving crew. The 1,250 horsepower diesel electric designed for mixed traffic. The 2,000 horsepower diesel hydraulic for express services to the southwest. To obtain immediate economies, diesels are already being used on routes that will ultimately be served by electric trains. For the passenger feeder lines to the trunk routes and where suburban electrification is not warranted, diesel multiple unit trains have been selected. Suburban and cross-country services are seeing more and more of these new diesels. Light, comfortable and fast, they are proving very popular. The new generation of train spotters is growing up with diesel and electric trains. During their lifetime, a changeover will take place as revolutionary as that from horse to steam. An evolution from steam to electric and diesel power. Diesel shunting locomotives have been replacing steam shunters on British railways over the last 20 years. The unromantic shunting operations in the sidings and marshalling yards, seldom seen by the public, are in fact vital to efficient railway working. Diesel locomotives can be divided into three different classes according to their transmission systems. The diesel electric generates its own electricity to drive traction motors mounted on the axles. The diesel hydraulic uses fluid in a torque converter in much the same way that steam is used in a steam turbine to convey the engine's power either directly to the wheels or through a gearbox. The diesel mechanical in the lower horsepower range uses a clutch or hydraulic coupling and a gearbox just like a motor car. More and more 
more industries in Britain and overseas are turning to the British diesel shunter to save on the cost of their internal transport. The ease and smoothness with which it handles heavy, dangerous loads adds to the diesel shunter's value in industries like steel. Coal mining also uses diesels for haulage both on the surface and below ground, where the exhaust gases are cleansed so as not to poison the atmosphere in the mine. In oil refineries and similar installations, where a stray spark might cause fire or an explosion, the diesel can be used in complete safety. Careful attention given to the design and maintenance of flame-proof equipment ensures that British diesel locomotives are the safest in the world. Wherever efficiency and economy are demanded, diesel locomotives can provide them. They can be employed continuously for long periods. They don't need to stop to take in water or to return frequently to depot for refueling. During idle periods, they consume no fuel, yet they are ready to go at the touch of the starter. It's a one-man job. No fireman is needed. And there is virtually no smoke. No machine can be admired without a thought for the men who made her. Untold skill, knowledge and labour of designers, engineers and craftsmen go into every locomotive made, and equal skill and care must be lavished on her maintenance. In their works, British manufacturers train apprentices and students from the countries in which their locomotives run. The British Railway's modernization plan has provided a shop window and a proving ground for the country's diesel and electric locomotives. Before an engine is sent abroad, further stringent tests are carried out in the industry's research establishments. For while one engine must be able to operate in the heat of countries like Africa or India, another must be tested for the extreme cold of a Scandinavian winter. The conditions which can be created in this refrigeration chamber are far more exacting than any the engines will come across in service. One hundred and thirty years of making locomotives are in themselves a guarantee behind every single locomotive built in Britain for service overseas, like this one bound for Spain. Another electric locomotive, its destination, South Africa. In Johannesburg, in the Union of South Africa, the rails stretch like metal sinews through the city, a steel network spreading out into the blue distance towards the vast silences of the high felt. Here, there is plentiful cheap coal, so electricity from coal-fed power stations is used. But on the desert stretches, where electrification would not be economic, the British steam condensing locomotive takes over. Here, the lack of water precludes the use of the conventional steam locomotive. But by condensing its exhaust steam in a special tender, this one can use the same water over and over again. Water is also scarce 5,000 miles to the northeast in India, in the Kutch Peninsula, but here the coal fields are far away. In a country where the old and new exist side by side, the traditional bullock cart and camel contrast strangely with the 625 horsepower diesel hydraulic locomotive. But this modern form of traction can also work efficiently in the hot, dry and sandy conditions. The climate in the 
cities of India may be different from that of London, but the advantages of railway electrification are the same. It is clean, flexible, and unsurpassed for high-density passenger traffic. East Africa, malarial mosquitoes and man-eating lions plagued the men who opened up the continent and drove this line from Mombasa on the coast to Lake Victoria. Today, this Bayer Garrett, the most powerful meter gauge locomotive in the world, travels on the same lightweight tracks which they laid down those 50 years ago, long before engines of its power and size were dreamed of, and hauls its heavy loads from the coast up steep inclines to Timbaroa, 9,000 feet above sea level. Wherever locomotives are required in any continent, the same pattern can be seen. The pattern of British locomotives tailored to suit particular requirements. Britain buys food and raw materials from many countries and in return exports capital equipment like locomotives. Such a partnership is seen in Australia. The fast Westlander diesel electric and the country rail cars in Queensland are typical of Britain's contribution. British built locomotives in New South Wales. These may well be hauling goods destined to go to Britain in return. Just as the terrain, the scenery and the colours of Brazil differ from those of Australia, so do the locomotives that Britain sends her. In service, their paintwork takes on a local colouring, but their working parts have been designed long before to suit the locality. The connection of British locomotive builders with Latin America is long established, Britain supplying the first locomotive to the Argentine in 1857. It is significant that today, these nations of South America, design conscious and so modern in their outlook, should still choose British diesel and electric locomotives. British locomotive industry is maintaining the lead given it by its pioneers. Research and development are constantly improving the design and performance of British locomotives. Individually adapted or produced in quantity, they can be suited for any haulage job. Ever-changing demands bring new ideas. New needs are met by even newer methods. But the build-up of experience is unbroken through the years from George Stevenson's Locomotion No. 1 to this 3,300 horsepower giant, the biggest single-unit diesel-electric in the world. The latest in a long, long line of successful British locomotives. <laughs> 